try this and see how it works. Do something a little bit different today. My name is Katherine Hubert. I am the owner at Chez Jeunesse. We are at my home today and the reason behind that is that today's video is a little bit more personal and so it felt fitting to do that in a space that's more personal. Hence, we're sitting on my front porch. The intent behind today was to talk about the difference between a disability and a disorder. I think that's something that can be confusing sometimes. What, like, where's the separation and the distinction? It's a question that we get asked in our workshops. But I realized as I was starting to prepare for that, that the experience that I really do have to bring to the table is living with a disorder. And I don't talk about that a lot publicly or honestly privately either. And it feels like that's relevant content and information to share with you all today. So that's what I'm gonna do. Avery just moved from the door to the window. <laughs> Avery's my dog. She would very much like to be part of this video right now and is communicating that to me on the other side of the door. So from my own personal experience, I'm gonna to talk just a little bit about what it's like to live with a disorder, how that impacts my life. And then next week, we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between a disability and a disorder, where that distinction lies. And is that something that's strictly based out of a medical diagnosis or is there some personal autonomy and self-diagnosis that can be rolled into that separation. From my own personal experience, I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder when I was 16 years old, so almost 20 years ago, and it was something that like my earliest memories of dealing with OCD were in my teenage years. And I don't think that that's totally uncommon. A lot of times as your brain is developing and changing, especially during those adolescent years, that can sometimes be when disorders develop. And that was the case for me. And it was pretty debilitating Initially, during that season, like around age 16 for me, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of therapy. <laughs> it was a very limiting time. Like the a lot of the things that I loved, a lot of the capabilities that I had, the motivation that I had changed during that season. And that was something that was really, really hard for me. I remember feeling like I was never gonna get to pursue the things that I wanted to or the things that I really loved to do in my life because of how strong the fear and the anxiety was in my life at that time and just how all-consuming that was in every activity, whether it was something that was small or it was something that was big and I had a really positive experience with counseling and therapy at that time that lasted for quite a few months. I know at least six months of really like intensive work and then probably some continued work after that. But that was a really transformative time in terms of learning how to live with and still function in the daily tasks that I wanted and needed to do and kind of getting used to my brain and getting to know my brain better, getting to understand it, getting to have a little bit more, I think, compassion for myself and trying to understand what my true thoughts were and what my obsessive thoughts were. <laughs> and how to distinguish between the two. So that season pretty strongly impacted and marked my life. 
and has set a foundation for the way that I walk through the world, both in really good and helpful ways and some in some not so helpful ways either. But in terms of being an adult and and taking on the world and pursuing school and pursuing a career and then starting a business, all of that, I think, you know, 20 years deep living with the brain and the body that I have, a lot of OCD and how that shows up in my life has been really integrated into my life and so I don't that's one of the reasons why I don't talk about it a lot is because I don't always think about it a lot there have been seasons in my life where where things have like anxiety has spiked and the more obsessive cycles uptick and that can be really debilitating sometimes. Those seasons have been kind of few and far between. I think I've learned some good management and maintenance skills and tools. I have a lot of tools in my tool belt over the years. And there are a lot of ways that I, on a daily basis, work to take care of myself and to help my brain and my my body stay healthy but that being said there has been a lot of integration I think that has happened and so I don't always pay a lot of attention or time to when OCD is showing up in my life and when it's not unless there's a strong shift one way or the other so on a daily basis what does that look like for me it looks like my brain is very active (laughs) and it is thinking constantly there are very few things that I have found that kind of help shut my brain off a little bit and allow me to be more present just in my body and those vary from season to season but that that all of those things are helpful. So rock climbing, I am very in my body and not in my head. Like the only thing that I can focus on is the very next (laughs) step. And so that's something that can be really helpful if I need to truly get out of my head. Learning something new that is going to challenge me is really helpful as well at least for redirecting my mind to a single task so like I did horseback riding lessons a couple of years ago and that was such a new thing for me and I had to be so aware of what my body was doing and what the horse was doing that also was really helpful for getting me outside of my head learning a different language that's intellectual but it's very focused I'm doing ASL classes at the moment Yoga and meditation can sometimes be very helpful embodiment practices, but I have to be in a state usually where my anxiety is not high in order for me to actually enjoy like meditation and yoga. Otherwise, sitting that still with my body can be a really, really hard thing for me to do. Running is something that I've done off and on over the course of my life, and or at least I started like when I was 20, so for the past, you know, 15 years. That, in some seasons, is more helpful than others. If my anxiety is super high, then running sometimes makes it higher because it's increasing your cortisol levels instead of decreasing it. But for the most part, like, that actually is a helpful outlet for kind of burning off some stress and steam for being outside, just move, moving my body I walk a lot, I try to be outside a lot, like there are a lot of small things that I do that just help keep me mentally and physically active and those things do a lot for my overall mental health. Creating spaces that feel really comforting and really safe is also something that is important to me. So my home is a space that I really focus on 
making feel cozy and that I want to be soothing. My workspace, I've tried to create that to be the same for myself and for the people that come in and eat at the restaurant. I very much set up spaces based on how they feel. <laughs> so not just like emotions that may be elicited by the way things are decorated, but the way that furniture is placed, I don't totally understand feng shui from an intellectual standpoint, but I do understand it from a body standpoint. And so I will walk into a space and I'm like, oh, it's not right. This is not the way that this furniture is supposed to be set up. And I'll like shift things around until it's like, oh, that feels okay. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't actually quite understand how like energy works and where it gets blocked and stored and all of that but I do like understand it from a physical standpoint making sure that I'm that I'm eating that I'm staying hydrated like all of those are super basic things but do really help me on a day-to-day -day basis it's also important for me not to take all of my thoughts seriously there and that's something that I've learned and I've grown in over the years is that there are a lot of thoughts that pass through my head and some of them I can really fixate on if if I choose to, but I've, I've learned more over the years to kind of just let things come and go and to not judge myself for the thoughts that I have, to, to pay attention to my own internal voice and the wisdom that I hold, but not like in terms of more of the obsessive or intrusive thoughts. I can typically tell which ones those are and just kind of let them let them go or let them run their course instead of taking them on as my own or taking them personally. So what does it look like to live with a disorder? Sometimes it can be really hard. Sometimes it can be really limiting. Sometimes it can make me feel very out of control and like like my brain has sabotaged me and is working against me and it's hard because our brains and our bodies are so connected so when my brain is acting that way then my body gets all out of whack and so I usually then try to pick one to focus on I'm like I can work on taking care of my body and hopefully that will help my brain to slow down and regain a sense of control or I can work on some of my mental practices and help my brain settle down so that my body can calm the F back down. Um, they're very intertwined. Um, so sometimes that can be really exhausting. It can take a lot of extra energy. It does help me, I think, hold a different level of compassion for myself and for people in my life and in the world. Just understanding that there can be a lot more that's underneath the surface for people than what we necessarily see or understand. Yeah, it's not something that I'm ashamed of. It's not something that I am like, yeah, all right, <laughs> about either. It's just a part of my life and a part of who I am and something that I live with and that's about it. So questions, comments, drop them below. I'm going to go take care of my dog, eat some breakfast, and head to work for a busy day today.